Hey everybody, I am Brian Bouters, and I'm gonna tell you a little bit about a project called MITM Proxy. And let me share my screen here so I can give you a little presentation demo. Uh, MITM Proxy is a great tool to help plugin development. So if you're developing a plugin and it has typically plugins you know, all content typically comes with a client of some kind. So for Python, it's pip, or for Maven, it's MVN. I guess the client's called Maven. Um, RPMs have YumDNF, uh, et cetera. So um, when you're developing a plugin, um, typically you want to really understand really clearly what the client is doing. And MITM proxy is a great way to make that really easy. Um, it is a open source, just like it says here, this is their homepage. Uh, it's a free open source interactive HTTPS proxy. So a lot of this, these client tools want to use HTTPS by default. Of course, that's the, the right secure default. Um, and so, uh, being a HTTPS proxy, you can just point the client at MITM proxy, and then it proxies the connections to the server side, which is. You know, normally these tools are designed to interact with some large content warehouse out there. For instance, like Python has PyPy.org and Maven has Maven Central and and so forth. Um, so you basically put MIT and proxy in the middle and then it shows you really clearly all the traffic traveling in both directions. Um, you can do this with other tools like Wireshark and things like that. Um, but part of the issue is that it um, the TLS connection between the client and the server that it's connecting to is TLS encrypted, which decrypting that is just an activity that you have to figure out um, how to do. And not that you like break the encryption, just like you would need to configure a TLS decryption key, which is just a lot more complicated. So MIT and proxy is a great tool. Um, let's actually do some MIT and proxy together. And then we'll have time for a question. Um, you can install this a bunch of different ways. You can download these binaries. You can uh, install from Python. It has like a PyPy based um, installation method. Just install it with uh, MIT and proxy with pip app, pipx apparently. But I'm going to use the Docker image because I, I think that's the easiest. I think it's also available as a package RPM on things like uh, Fedora, which is how I originally used it. But um, what we're going to do here is I'm going to use the um, MIT and proxy container that's published on, I think I got this one from Docker Hub. So if you go click here on the Docker images, you'll see its page. It's got a bunch of commands. I'm running this command down here because um, this MIT and proxy comes with two different tools. One of them is a couple tools, like there's the proxy itself, but then there's um, MIT M dump, which is just the actual proxy, but then there's MIT M web, which is a web interface for browsing the traffic as it happens. I, I really like that part of it. So I'm going to use this, which starts, um, MIT M web and also makes it available at port. Let me make this bigger. It makes that available at port 8081 and, um, MIT M proxy itself is going to run here at port 8080. So let's go ahead and run that. Um, this is that same command. Uh, I'm telling it this says dash dash web host option starts on my TM web and it's running right now. So if you go over and point um, at, uh, let's see here. So if I just go to my web browser at port 880, you can see the basic web interface. There's not been any traffic that's occurred here yet. Um, you can do some nice things on this web interface, like you can install certificates if you have them, which is great. It uses self, uh, self-generated certificates otherwise. And so um, let's go look at PIP doing some traffic. Um, I'm going to, uh, let's see. I'm going to make a, a virtual env because I'm going to demonstrate this with PIP as my client, but you could use YUM or GNF or Maven or really any client. You can use curl. Um, so. Uh, I just made a virtual M because I'm going to Brian calling into it. Yep. J just so you know, we don't see your terminal if you're sharing it. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah, because I didn't do this right. That's really helpful. 
Um, uh, let me share my entire screen, not just that one window. Is this right? No, that's not right. Oh, perfect. Thanks a bunch, you know. Um, you should be able to see it, uh, the terminal now. Um, yes. Perfect. So uh, you, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to I'm going to install the request package from PyPy. Uh, Pip is my client, and um, the proxy. The important part is I have to tell the client to use this proxy. Um, so pretty much all the client tools are aware and support proxies. So you know whether it's Yum or Maven or like whatever the tool is, it's going to have a proxy part to it. So you just got to go and find the proxy and tell it to point at MITM proxy, which is port 8080. Um, and Python, because it's using self-signed certificates, um, I need to tell the Python client to not trust any of the certs. You know, I could generate certs and install them and then tell PIP to use those certs. But, um, instead I'm just going to configure PIP not to require, not, not to need them to be trusted. It requires a lot of these commands. Um, like I need to tell it to, to trust pypy.org, to trust pypypython.org, to trust this site. And I need to tell it to trust um, uh, MIT and proxy itself. Um, this is kind of a finicky thing with PIP. Other clients make this easier. Um, um, yep. Do you have the proxy specified twice? No, I don't. Um, it's okay. confusing because of, um, I'm glad you asked. So this part here, this dash dash, uh, oh, I do have it specified twice. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Dennis. Um, this should not be here. Thanks. Yeah, well, well, well said. Um, so uh, according to my, my client, it's going to be talking with pypy.org, but really it's talking with my proxy. And so that's why I needed to just like blindly trust whatever's handed back from python.org, which in this case is the, the client CA. So. Um, I don't want to do any caching, so I told it not to do caching. That way it does all the requests. So let me go ahead and fetch this. Um, so it's making some requests. And if you look over at MITM proxy on the web interface, you'll see that you can see all these requests here. Um, so this is where you can just basically easily look at all the traffic. So first thing it does is it makes a request to this here. And you can see the server's response, which is really great and, and pulp modeling um, what their server is supposed to respond with. And then you see it fetch this thing, and then this thing, and this thing. Um, and that's the beauty of MIT and proxy. Uh, the last thing I want to call out is that um, if you notice, I had to configure this in, and we talked about this, in um, with the dash dash proxy setting. So uh, there's also a way to configure it as what's called a transparent proxy, where you don't actually um, need to tell the client to do anything. And what you end up doing in this deployment is configuring your IP forwarding and um, redirection so that your client believes it's just talking to the real endpoint. But in fact, um, IP tables is routing that traffic to MIT and proxy. Um, and this is what's called a transparent proxy because the client is not configured to use a proxy. It's not even aware that it's using a proxy. And this supports those kinds of deployments too. There you go. Nice. Thank you, Brian. You have one minute for questions before while Kieran is preparing. <laughs> yeah, nice uh, showing off the web interface. I used uh, this proxy for doing the Maven plugin development. Um, and I used the just terminal interface, which was actually a really fancy terminal interface. Um, but and I thought that's what you were gonna demo. So but the web interface is nice too. All right. Uh, with that, hand it over to Kieran. Kieran, take it away. Okay. I guess you can see my screen. Yes. Uh, so I will be talking about the Pulp Dev 3.0 release. And in case you want more than the five minute version, we wrote a blog post about it, uh, but who has times to read? So I'm just going to talk about three things about the release right now. Um, 
And yeah, all the important links are here on the Mining Talks page. So the first thing I want to talk about is I'm going to head over to the release announcement. Um, and it has this nice warning box here because we added a uh, fixed some uniqueness constraints, which caused us to need a data changing DB mi database migration. And so anyone who has an existing deployment and has a lot of Debian content and has a lot of affected content and upgrades to pulp dev 30 can expect a median of 30 minutes database migration. Um, the, the actual number varies considerably because it's just completely dependent on how much affected content you have. So it could be no extra time compared to a normal upgrade, or it could be significantly longer than the 30 minutes if you have a lot of content. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to mention that. And the next thing I wanted to show is a small but emblematic user-facing change. And uh, I'm going to explain using pulp CLI. Uh, so it used to be that if you want to create a pulp Debian publication, you have to, it was manually provide the mode that this publication should use. So you would either have to specify simple or else you could specify structured or else you could specify both, but you had to do it explicit. And with pelt depth 3.0, that is no longer the case. Uh, so you don't want to specify these things at all. And what you will get is a structured publication and no simple publication. And the reason is just um, going forwards for new users and most users, we don't want them to use simple. So all workflows should work the structured way. And we added a lot of documentation to that effect. And so it seemed reasonable to make it the default behavior and not have people need to research what simple and structured in the context of pulp depth means before they can start using it. Okay. And the final thing I wanted to mention about the Pulp Dev 3.0 release is documentation. So we completely rewrote the or reworked the first three chapters of the docu documentation. Uh, installation, I think, now points you mostly at Pulp Core documentation, but it tells you about setting up Pulp CLI and also other tools that are used in the rest of the documentation. Um, yeah, and I think now I'm just gonna skip to the workflows documentation, which and and specifically the sync documentation. So the new thing is we now have a nice minimal full working example using pulp CLI as like to really get people started. We have some variations on what you can or how you can use that workflow. Uh, we explain the most important required parameters for creating up to remotes in detail. We have some best practice recommendations that everyone is free to ignore. And then we have uh, some special repository format cases or examples for those. And the one thing I still wanted to show in the hosting up repositories, we also have some documentation on metadata signing, which was sorely lacking before, and in particular, how to set up a signing service for your pulp dev. And yeah, that is pretty much what I wanted to say about the pulp dev 3.0 release. And Specifically, the documentation, I think, is a much better entry point for new users. But maybe now there's also the some new content for veteran users, like best practices that might be worth rereading the documentation. And if you want more detail, like I said, feel free to read the blog post. That's it, unless there are questions. Thank you, Kieran. Uh, your blog looks very juicy.
And I think I actually managed to make it a five minute talk. So, yeah, I'm proud of myself. <laughs> <laughs> Great. All right. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, and, um, Lubos, over to you. Thanks. Let me share screen. All righty, can you see the presentation? Yes. Okay. Let me know when I should start. Yeah. Anytime. Cool. So, hello, everyone. My name is Lubos and I am a lead for the pub container plugin. Recently, the leadership was handed over from Ina to me. So I am new in this position. So today's topic is what's new and what will be new in the containers plugin. What's new? We improved the manifest downloading. So instead of querying the remote registries all the time, we are we are just fetching the digest of manifest and not sending get request. Also, we improved the handling of push operation and we no longer create multiple repositories or multiple repository version when parsing the content like it was before. Also, we added flat pack support and I invite you to Stefan's talk tomorrow, and he will talk about this in more detail. Also, we added support for call sign signatures as bonds and attestations, which promote security and compliance in content management. And last but not least, we made OCI artifact types configurable so administrators can decide which artifacts should be validated or stored within pub or not. What you should expect? Right now we are working on the full through caching. I will give you a quick demo in a minute. We also are, we are also planning to have just one repository type. So right now we've got two repository types, one for pushing and one for syncing. And we want to merge those. So you will be able to sync content to a repository that stores pushed content. We are also planning to support Freefers API, which is the new OCI v1.1 specific. And the idea is that in the future, we will no longer have just container registry, but we will have an artifact registry. And on top of that, we will store not just the artifacts, but also the relations between still those artifacts. And Refers API basically natively supports like retrieving or fetching those relations. So when you are pulling an image, from a registry, you will be also be able to pull really simply as bombs or signatures or whatsoever. And also we are planning to extend the usage for image building. So users will be able to write the container file with some specs and pulp will or is even now able to build an image in a house and then you can consume it. So now I'm going to show you what is a pull through caching. And so I'm now running a container with the pulled image. 
And in the past where you wanted to sync content from, for instance, Docker Hub, you were supposed to specify repository name, like so, for instance, library, busy box. But, but with the pull through caching, you are just specifying the reference to the registry, like that, and, and create the distribution for that. It will uh, proxy that content from the remote. So, and if you do podman pull, uh, cache, box, it will automatically download the, oh, sorry. automatically download the content from the registry, the Docker Hub registry, and store it within pulp. So next time when a user is pulling an image, it will directly go through the file system storage. So we are not hitting the Docker Hub registry. And also on top of that, you can query the pulled content you can just have a look at the, the tags which were pulled and manage it further on, like with the usual repositories. And I think that's all from my side. Now it's room for questions. Yeah, Ina mentioned um, possibly pre-creating things in Pulp Container. Um, can you speak to that pre-creating repositories? What does it mean, pre-creating? Um, like, so this example you gave of creating a pull-through cache of Docker Hub, mm -hmm. um, do you see any value in having that already be provided by like a migration where there's when you install pulp container you just get this mirror right it would just pull through cache right away i'm not sure what you are talking about but basically administrators could define their remotes and distributions and all those repositories will be created in the background so yeah yeah no i understand i'm saying that so that administrators don't even have to do that um that whenever you first install pulp it already has those repositories defined because they're known uh -huh. as yeah. the you know re repo the, the, the docker hub mirror the quay mirror yeah it will just have a built-in distribution mm -hmm. for or built-in cache for docker hub or quay yeah yeah we can consider that we don't have such a thing right now yeah yeah, yeah. yep um, Dennis, besides the pre-creating, what I wanted to point out is that in the Maven workflow, workflow you needed to uh, create the remote and the repo and trigger the the load right ahead. Mm -hmm. So, so here the difference is that we create just the distribution, and based on what the client pulls, we transparently in pulp create the uh, repository and the load. I mean, cache the content. Like you don't need to pre-cache it. It's being cached and streamed right away to the client. Along the way. And it's much more yeah. convenient that you don't need to create the repo ahead. Because right now, uh, if you want to distribute content and pull from it, you need to create the repo and prepare it basically. And here it's created transparently. I got you. Um, yeah, we, in Pulp Maven, the repository is not created um, automatically, but you don't actually have to create the repository either. Um, but if you want to 
add it to a repository version so content's not our orphan um it should be but what i'm hearing is that maybe it would be better if users did not have to create a repository version uh, at all yes and that it was created for them yes exactly Matthias? This, this was mm. one of the complaints from the users that they needed to create those repos and remotes. And here they will just need to take one step to create the distribution for Docker Hub. And then whenever there will be sp specified this prefix of the Docker Hub, like Podman pool Docker Hub slash library busybox, busy it will transparently create all the resources needed in pulp. Yeah, I think what is very different here is that in the container or a pulp container, a repository is slightly differently scoped. I think uh, what Dennis is, uh, wanted to say is you have the one distribution pointing to the Maven Central, then you have one repository which can basically contain everything that was downloaded. And in pulp container, you still have the one upstream registry but every single um, container name would be created as a separate repository downstream. And that's really a pain if you need to pre-create them all. But for the Maven workflow, you just create it once and then you're done with it. Thank you for that explanation, Matthias. Brian? Yeah, I had two questions and we're almost out of time. Um, the um when you do pull through caching does it create do you just end up with a lot of repository versions that's one just one like if i pull like if one client pulls one thing and another client pulls another you'd end up with two but yeah if you're pulling one image it will create one repository if another client will pull another image within the same repository but with different tag there will be created a new repository version containing the old tag and the new tag. Cool. Um, thanks. And then my other question was, can you just real quickly talk about, I think I saw a bullet point on one of your slides about image building. Um, maybe I mm -hmm. missed it. Can you just talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, so there are some plans to extend its functionality. Uh, Basically, we got this feature, we've tested it a little bit. I think it was implemented by Dennis. And we're now planning to extend its usage and add more work workflows for that. Because there is, a, there is an idea to use this building like across the other Red Hat products, where we can basically specify some set of instructions, build that image, and use that image as a space for booting operating systems. So, yeah. Cool, so the state of the feature set, thank you. So the state of the feature set right now is like you can hand it a container file and yes. you can ask a uh, pulp container to build to produce you a container from that container file. Yeah, and then you can pull that in. Awesome, thanks. Um, have you considered using a pulp file repository version as a build context? Not yet. Well, soon That's pulp file is gonna be available idea. to your OS, to your container installation anyway. Yep. Ina? Um, yeah, I had a question on one of the slides where we, uh, you mentioned that we improved the manifest download. Uh, what it's, what kind of benefits does it bring compared to previous state we had? So it allows us to tackle the Docker Hub pool limits. So when you've got the free account, Docker Hub, you can just pull, I don't know, 60 images for six hours. But with this feature, we are not 
using that limit, we are basically not changing the am amount of pulls. So eventually, when you are resyncing the content from Docker Hub multiple times, let's say a day, you are not losing any kind of pulls if, no if nothing has changed. So because we are checking just for the digest of those manifests, and if they are not changed, we are not issuing a get request to the Docker Hub, and thus we are not uh, intercepting with the pull limits. Okay, thank you. Yeah, that's really handy. Um, folks, we are out of time, but I want, for the sake of fairness, to uh, all the folks who, got, who had lightning talks, um, I and Lubush was last, so he got all the questions. So if you have any questions to Brian or Kieran, or maybe more to Lubush, <laughs> definitely ask uh, now. All right, sounds like there is not, not no question. So uh, then folks, thank you so much. It was the first day uh, of PopCon. So great talks, great presentations. Um, thanks to everyone who attended. And please check out the schedule for tomorrow. And we hope to see you all tomorrow and all the recordings I hope to post today to our YouTube channel. So have a nice rest of the day. Thank you. See you Thanks, tomorrow. Buddy. Thank you all.